I have the privilege this morning of introducing you to Pastor Mark Neal. He is lead pastor of our sister church just up the street. It's the, the little one on at Vegas, is it Vegas and Buffalo, Shadow Hills. You know? <laughs> but Pastor Mark, they've graciously loaned him to us this morning, and he's going to come and bring God's word to us. Brother, Thank come you. speak to us. Thank you. I think I'm on. There we go. And good to see you this morning. Thanks for allowing me to come over. Uh, I traveled all the way from the Summerlin area over there. So uh, I want you to know, though we've never met before, that our church has been uh, praying for you. Our staff, we, we pray for you every Monday morning and Spring Valley Baptist Church, and we're looking forward to seeing great things from this church and what God would have it to do uh, in the coming days. I understand that you've been uh, listening to Pastor Neil Creasy. Uh, he works with me, and he has my first name, and I have my Neil, or he, his first name is my last name, N-E-A-L, so we have names in common, but you get to see the better looking one today uh, with uh, me. Uh, next week, uh, I hear you have the uh, privilege of uh, listening to our executive pastor, and his name is Damien, and uh, he'll be here. We're a good friend of mine that loves Jesus, and we just want you to know we're for you, and we thank God for this church and what it's doing, and uh, we've been praying, praying, and praying for you. I enjoyed the music today. I hope that you did too, and everybody did a great job, and uh, I, I hope that uh, the, the, me being here today uh, would be a blessing to you through God's Word. You know, um, I, I thought about what to say. Uh, you come in one time, and we don't know each other. If you're new here, uh, so am I. It's our first time together, and I, I hope that you'll give this church a, a try, and I, I know it'll be a blessing to you. It's been a faithful church for many, many years, but I thought about what could I say uh, to you today? Uh, what could I bring to you from God's Word that would <clears throat> make you better from when, <clears throat> from when you came? But you know, we have so many examples in life. Uh, I don't know about you, but growing up, uh, there were certain public figures that uh, I would look to. Um, uh, when I was uh, growing up, my, my children's age, uh, in our house, our, our hero was John Wayne. Anybody know of John Wayne? Uh, we'd dress up like cowboys, and we watched all his movies, and my dad loved John Wayne, and uh, I, I memorized all his sayings. And uh, maybe you have someone you grew up with, you had a public figure that uh, you looked up to, and even now as an adult, there are people that I admire. There's people that I talk to, that I, I get advice from from, that they are, have gone in life before me and they've been successful. I don't know if you know anybody like that, but a, a mentor in life or someone that you look to that seems to have uh, somewhat of their life together that you could learn from and glean from uh, as an example in, in your life. I, I, I try to sometimes uh, uh, use them as an example and apply it to my life. You know, our youth today uh, have so many different people to look at. Our youth today have so many different people that they can um, uh, look to. And, you know, social media has made getting to public figures a whole lot easier. How many of you would agree with that? Uh, I don't know if you heard this thing called Facebook. Anybody ever heard of that? Uh, the other day, a couple weeks ago, I heard that Facebook uh, shut down for a little while. And it was amazing because there was reports coming in that uh, uh, children met their parents for the first time in the house. And uh, uh, mom and dads met each other. And uh, it was amazing how they, they figured out each other's names names because Facebook was down for a couple hours. Uh, the Twitter, anybody heard of Twitter? Anybody heard of Twitter? Uh, it's it's a, a social media where 140 characters people can put out there and you can get to know people. And young people have at their fingertips public figures to look to. Uh, you can follow on Twitter or Facebook some of your favorite personalities. Uh, let, let me give you, for instance, um, uh, Katy Perry. I don't know if you know who she is, but she has 54.8 million followers on Twitter. Can you imagine that? 54.8 million. Th think of this, Justin Bieber. He's slacking. He only has 53.2 million followers followers on Twitter. And think of this, Oprah has 24.9 million followers on Twitter. Then there's a singer named Beyonce that has 13.5 million followers on Twitter. And then there's myself, Mark Neal. I have about 600 followers on Twitter. What is up with that? Uh, but social media can get us um, very close to the people uh, we look to or we are interested in. It's amazing to me the influence of one public 
figure can change the, the way we dress, the way we talk, the way we act, the, the, the way we do things because we look at uh, public figures and we, we look at how they are. It's amazing how our teenagers today, they, they look to public figures and it can change everything about them. Um, I, I was uh, at a dinner a couple weeks ago. We had a big birthday dinner on a Saturday night. My family went, it was like uh, adopted grandparents. They've been in our life for over 11 years and kind of grandparents to the kids and it was a big occasion and it was uh, the, the grandmother's birthday. It was a big formal event. And here's my family. And she was going around taking pictures with people. And all of a sudden, my six-year-old little girl named Haley, she jumps into a picture as they were taking it. And she says the word swag and yells real loud. And, and, and they took the picture and everybody started laughing. And she comes over to me and she says, dad, I photobombed the picture. Isn't that awesome? I don't know if you know what photobomb is, but I guess that's when you jump into someone's picture and mess it up and say something funny and it, it's, it messes up the whole picture. Uh, yeah, you're looking at me. I don't know what that means. Uh, I didn't either until my six-year-old daughter taught me that. Uh, but it was amazing how she learned that. Uh, the other day, I, I walked into my house, my 11-year-old son. I walked in from work, and I came home from the office, and I said, hey, Jonathan, how you doing? And he said, hey, what's up, dog? like, what do you mean, what's up, dog? I, I said, what's up, cat? I, don't, I have no idea. Where, where do you learn this language? What in the world did you just say to me? Anybody have kids that talk like that or uh, uh, are strange like my, I'm the only one. Okay, we are strange. <laughs> you know, I, 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 it amazes me. Examples surround us and we're impacted by them. Whoever thought what's up, dog would be in our vocabulary? Whoever thought that different words we would say, and it's amazing that even if you're older, you go, these kids these days. Yeah, you were, you were that way too. Uh, we all had public figures that we uh, looked at. We all had public figures that molded us and, and made us. And with all the famous people, uh, we connect with an error by the icon of the time. It's amazing how quickly uh, that popular public figure fades off the scene, isn't it? It's amazing how quickly that, that person that everybody looks to, all of a sudden they're gone or they pass on or they're not popular anymore. Even in today's society, we want everything quick. And, and, and if you don't hang on and, and you don't keep up with the times, then guess what? You're going to be behind the times very quickly because you're not paying attention. Why? Because people fade off the scene very quickly. You know, I, I, I connect with certain people, you do too, and we could sit here and talk about different people who, famous people who have come and gone and been influential uh, to us, uh, and there is an icon, though, that never fades away. You know, there, there's, there's someone that never fades off the scene. Jesus Christ can be and should be a Christian's greatest example and influence. You know, unfortunately, in, in, in today's world as believers, we get so caught up in our circumstance. We get so caught up in, in what we're going through. We get so caught up with public figures that we forgive. We have the greatest example to live by, and that is Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus Christ never fades. Jesus Christ is just as popular today as he was yesterday. Jesus Christ will always be that popular. He will live forever. He will be the number one icon to ever walk planet Earth. You see, Jesus not only came to this world to save it from itself and pay our debt, but he also lived a perfect life for 33 years for an example to us to follow. He knew that when he died on the cross that it would not be good for him to swoop down and die on a cross and leave again, but he planned and he lived a perfect life for 33 years and he gave you and I a perfect example through this sin sick world to follow so that we could look to him and our time of need. We could look to him in our time of circumstantial failures. We could look to him when we had circumstances that were out of our control. And we could look to him when the enemy would attack us. And we could look to him to how to properly love people who are unlovable. And we could look to him through all life's problems. Jesus came as the greatest example for the Christian to follow. You know, sometimes we act so surprised that non-believers act like non-believers. Uh, we act surprised in our community today that people who don't know G Jesus uh, don't act like Jesus. But what's even sadder today and the problem in society today is I believe that believers in our community need to look to Jesus as an example so that we can be Christ-like and show the light of Jesus while we live on planet Earth. You know, we search so long and hard for examples. Uh, we'll buy a book to be a better this. Or we'll look to this person to do a uh, better at this. 
or we'll try and read something or we'll look on the internet or we'll, we'll try and talk to someone for the a, a, a same situation that we're going through and we'll try and use them as an example when right in front of us, Jesus left the believer his example of a life so that we could look to him and that we could be more like him. You know, we search so long, but Jesus did not swoop down and die on a cross, but he knew we would need a perfect example to follow as we live in an imperfect world. He knew we would need a perfect example to look to as we looked in life and walked through this life. He knew that there would be different stages of life. He knew there would be times when we would need parenting tips. He knew there would be times when we need to look to him for financial uh, uh, advice. He knew that there would be times when we would need marriage counseling. He knew that there would be times when we need uh, to know how to behave. And he knew that there would be times when we knew how to transition in life. He knew that there would be times when there would be faults and failures of our own that we would have to get over as well. You know, my goal through this message today is to get us to look at the life, the example of Jesus Christ and understand that everything you face as well as how to act in life comes ultimately from the ultimate icon Jesus Christ and Luke chapter 2 we're going to look at today the end of Luke chapter 2 Luke chapter 2 is a pretty famous chapter but we're going to look at the end and, and, and let me say this as we look at the end of the chapter we have one last glimpse of Jesus the child. I thought this would be a good place for you and I to pay attention to because Jesus as a young boy shows us one of the greatest examples as we live on planet earth. Jesus was the son of God, but he had to grow in knowledge. Jesus showed at a young age the importance of devoting yourself to the word of God. And so we look at this passage of scripture, and if you'll look with me in Luke chapter number two, and we're going to read verse number 41, and I want to read a couple verses of scripture uh, to you, and I want us to talk about today a little bit about Jesus, a life devoted to the word. You know, Jesus showed us an example at a young age where to get our inspiration. Jesus showed us as an example of a young age how important the word of God is in a Christian's life. Jesus showed us an example at a young age how important it was for us as believers, for us that go to church, for us that sing worship songs. He showed us that the most important thing that we can do at a young age is for us to devote ourselves to the word of God. If you're writing notes, the title of the message today is uh, uh, the example of devoting your life to his word. Uh, verse number 41 says this, now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey, but then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. You know, and, and, and verse 46 says, after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. In this passage, we see that his parents could not find him. Every year... It was custom to travel to Jerusalem to the Passover. The Passover was a celebration. The Passover was used to, to fellowship. It was used to celebrate, but it was also used to learn more about God. This was a time of learning, celebrating, and fellowship with others. They would travel in, in large groups, and sometimes the women would head back before the men would head back, and, and sometimes the men would come later, and they would travel in these large groups, sometimes a large family, sometimes multiple families. So it was natural, so to speak, for uh, families to travel back home differently. I don't know about you, but maybe in times if you've had children or you have children right now, but there's times where you thought mom had the child and mom thought dad had the child. Anybody testify to that with me? Uh, a, a couple years ago, I, I pastored across town in Henderson and, and I had some uh, counseling appointments after church and after church I had counseling appointments and my middle son, Jonathan, wanted to go home with me, ride home with dad. And so uh, mom told me, hey, hey, uh, Jonathan's gonna ride home with you. I was so tired after the service. I walked out the door, got in my car, was driving home, but I left somebody. He was still in the gym playing with his friends. 
my wife called me on the cell phone and she goes, hey, Mark. I said, hey, Lori, how you doing? And, and she said, hey, you got Jonathan, right? And I said, yep, I got to go. And I turned and did a U-turn and about killed everybody trying to turn around and drove to church. I walked in the door and there's Jonathan and he was still playing with his friends. He didn't know that I left him. And to this day, he doesn't know that I left him. And let's not tell him. <laughs> he was consumed with playing with his friends. You know, I, I, can, I, can, I can identify with Mary and Joseph and losing a child I can identify with Mary and Joseph and not knowing where they're at and the panic, the horror, the terror for you not to know where your child is. Well, if they're a teenager, you like celebrate. You don't know. Where, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> then Mary and Joseph found him. And when they found him, they looked at all the places. How many of you would think all the places a 12-year-old would be would be in a church studying with the leaders of the church? Anybody like that? That's the last place they thought. And they walked in and there Jesus was. Jesus was at the feet. The Bible says that he was sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. You know, it, it's possible that, that Mary and, and Joseph could have lost Jesus because of the way they traveled. But I, I believe that Jesus shows us something. And the first thing I want you to write down was in this passage, we see that Jesus was consumed with the word. Jesus was consumed with the word. I want you to notice something. If you look at these passages of scripture that we just read in this passage, right, this text, if you look at it, it was a day. It was, it, it was several hours. It was a day. It was, it was a long time that Jesus and Mary and Joseph were not together. But Jesus was so focused on learning about God's word. He was so focused with being consumed with the word of God that nothing fazed him. You know, Jesus was consumed in the word that he lost track of all time. His number one priority was to learn more about the father. His number one priority was to learn more about what God wanted from him and God wanted for the world. And ladies and gentlemen, at Spring Valley Baptist Church and churches all over the city, wouldn't it be amazing that everyone who attended walked through the doors of a worship center this morning in our valley? They were consumed with the word. They left consumed with the word instead of getting caught up in everything else we can get caught up in. We got consumed with what God was telling us, how we could change the course of time in our own city. You see, Jesus showed us an example of being consumed. We're consumed with so much in life. We get caught up in, in, and we get caught up in how we look. We get caught up with our finances. We get caught up in the news. We get caught up in the economy. We get caught up in who likes us and who doesn't like us. We get caught up in all the issues of life that we forget as believers of Jesus Christ, that the word of God is what gives us energy of life and the word of God is what gives us answers of life and the word of God is what gives us peace in life and the word of God is what gives us uh, a security in life and we leave the word of God out of the very life that we say we believe in Jesus Christ you see Jesus showed an example you want an example of the life of Jesus from a young boy he showed us the importance of the word of God he was consumed with God's word I wonder in our homes today if we were consumed to get the answers from God how our homes would be different if we were consumed to get the example of Jesus Christ through the word of God how our co-workers and our relationship would be different if we were consumed about how to treat the lost and the lostness of the city how would we be mean or would we be nice to people if we were consumed with how God wanted us to act how would we treat others and ladies and gentlemen the best example that you can get is from the word of God and Jesus showed us through his life that being consumed with God's word is one of the best things that you can do for yourself and with others you know we claim Christianity and we've received Jesus Christ, but church has become a thing we do on the weekend and we leave it until the next weekend. You see, unfortunately, 
Church has become a checklist that we check off and we feel good about singing worship songs and we feel good about listening to the pastor's message and we feel good about, and we wait for a story from the pastor to give us an inspiring word. More importantly than an inspiring word is the living, breathing word of God that is read from you and from the pastor and from everyone else and consuming your life with God's word, not just on Sunday, but consuming your life with God's word Monday through Saturday as well. You know, as believers in Christ, if we are going to make a difference in our own lives and the lives of others, then it doesn't come from an inspiring story. It doesn't come from a delivery of a message on Sunday. It comes from you being personal with the consumption of the Word of God. You know, Jesus was not consumed with church. Jesus was consumed with the Word. Jesus wasn't worried about what worship song was sung and how what style it was sung. It's amazing to me in American church today. Jesus wasn't concerned if the lights were too bright or not bright enough. Jesus wasn't concerned if someone took to his parking space. Jesus wasn't concerned about what was going on other than was the word of God being taught and wherever it was being taught, I wanted to listen and he was consumed with God's word. We get so caught up with everything else in church today. We get so caught up with our own comfort. We get so caught up with personalities that we don't understand the reason we go to church is the feast on the word of God. Boy, if we had more churches today, more people in the body of Christ who proclaim Christ would be consumed with Christ. How different church would look in America today. You know, it's important to be consumed with God's word. Here's, here's the second thing, if you're taking notes. Jesus listened to the teachers of God's word. Jesus listened to the teachers of the word. Notice in verse number 46. Look at two verses. Verse 46 says this, after three days, they found him in the temple. Three days, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Verse 47 says this, and all who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. I, I wrote these in my notes and maybe something you ought to like hopefully we'll remember or write it down. Jesus was doing less talking and more listening when his parents found him. Jesus was doing less talking and more listening when his parents found him. You know, it seems like when we go to God, we do more talking. Really, we should be doing more listening to God. I, I find this interesting. We as Christians uh, live life more on theory than we do on the facts of God's word. We live life on theory. Uh, how many of you can see the future? How many of you know what the future holds for you in the next 10 years? We don't. And we live off of theory of our own thoughts. We live off of theory of what someone else does instead of living off the facts of God's word. If you're a believer in Christ, you obviously believe this book. If you're a believer in Christ, you obviously believe the promises of God. But so often we uh, push aside the promises of God and we live on the theory of life. You know, a poll is kind of a little uh, humor in this, but a poll was taken with Christians and what their favorite Bible verses were. And this poll was taken, it was an internet uh, poll, and, and they were submitting Bible verses. And a majority uh, of a Bible verse came up uh, that people liked and favorited and they thought was a great Bible verse. Let me tell you a favorite Bible verses. God helps those who helps themselves. Another one was as cleanliness is next to godliness. Those were favorite Bible verses. Did you know those are not Bible verses? And now if, if, if you're a mom and you have teenagers in your home, you wish cleanliness was next to godliness in the word of God. Can I get a witness on that one? But those are not scriptural. You know what happens? We as believers, we get so caught up in this world that we mix our theory with proclaiming Christ, but we're not listening to God's word. We're not consumed with God's word. So we're illiterate when it comes to the promises of God. Our knowledge of God's word is limited because our devotion is missing and we're not listening to gain the knowledge we need. And Jesus gave us the example of listening to what God's word says. He was listening to his teachers. I believe this verse says a lot. 
of what Christians need when listening. Uh, if, if you're writing things down in this verse, I want to show you uh, when it says in verse six, he was listen, or verse 46, he was listening to them and asking the questions. The first thing I believe this verse shows us is we need to listen to what he is saying when we read God's word. We need to listen to what he is saying when we read God's word. Have you ever been involved with someone who was listening to what you said just so you would hurry up and be quiet so they could tell you what was on their mind? Anybody been involved in a conversation? Now, how many of you would say, I'm guilty of that sometimes? You know, well, uh, a lot of times we go to God, we want him to hurry up to say what we, he has to say because we got a lot to say to him. You know, I, it's one, of these, one, one of the things that you can practice is a quiet time. Maybe you don't know what that is, a quiet time, starting your day, 30 minutes a day. 30 minutes a day where uh, 10 minutes you read scripture, 10 minutes you pray, 10 minutes you read a devotion. But, but saying that instead of listening to an inspirational song on the way to work, that I will actually read God's word. I'm not against scriptural songs. I'm not against getting together with other believers. I'm not against with just reading uh, inspiring thoughts from man. But I'm against it when we push aside the living, breathing word of God that we proclaim and we're illiterate because we're not listening to God's word. You know, if you want an example, look what Jesus did. A quiet time. Uh, number two, we need to let others teach us God's word. I don't know how uh, things are done at Spring Valley, but maybe small groups. Sunday school, small groups. Are you involved in a smaller group? Are you going deeper into God's word? Uh, letting someone teach you God's word. Uh, coming to church uh, on Sundays is not enough for you to listen to God's word. But being involved in a, uh, in a setting where you can have a Bible study is another way. You know, here, here's something else, some advice to give. We need to learn to look past the messenger and his delivery and look at the truth from the word of God he is giving. Because the truth of the, God, the word of God is a lot more important than who's giving the truth of the word of God. In verse 47, Jesus amazes people by his answers. And I believe that comes from the fact that he was intently listening. He was intently listening to what the teachers were teaching him about God. And then in verse 47, if you look there, it says, And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. You know, what if we were able to answer every man from the word because we were listening and applying the word of God to our lives? What if that person who was questioning your faith, what if someone who asked you what you believe, what if every one of us in this room were able to answer every man when it came to your faith and why you live the way you do? You know, 1 Peter chapter number 3 and verse 15 says this. It says, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who ask you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Do it with gentleness and respect. You know, it, it should be uh, something that we strive to be able to answer every man. That's how we honor Jesus Christ, by learning about him, by listening to teachers. Here's the next one. Jesus' priority was the word. Jesus' priority was the word. In verse number 48, let me read this to you. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father, I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? By the response of Jesus to his parents, we see a couple things. I want, I want you to take note of this. Circle, if you, if you underline or mark your words, uh, underline the word, I must be. I must be, it's the last part of verse 49. I must be gives us a sense of obligation to God that is controlling Jesus' life. He sensed that God was controlling his life. Then I want you to look at the words, in my father's house. In my father's house that he says these words indicates that age 12, Jesus clearly was aware of being God's son. He also understood that teaching would be central to his ministry and that his first priority was to serve his heavenly father. Jesus gave us the example that God's word was his priority. It seems we get wrapped up in good things that keep us from great things. Let me make a statement to you. The word of God can often get neglected for the work of God. 
The word of God can often get neglected for the work of God. You know what happens when people come faithfully to church? They often leave out studying the word of God and putting the word of God priority and the work of God becomes their relationship with Jesus. My friend, this is the easy mistake that I've seen for years. I've grown up in a pastor's home. I've been in church all my life and I see so many good people wrap their relationship up in the work of God instead of the word of God and they cannot uh, last the test of time because they are not in the word of God but they're just doing the work of God. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to be successful in your Christian life, take the example of Jesus of making the word of God your priority and then when you make the word of God of your, your priority, you live out of the overflow of your relationship with Jesus and it makes you want to serve him and makes you want to work for him and so your priorities are in the right direction so that you have longevity in the Christian life. Many people end up neglecting the word of God for the work of God. I am so thankful if you serve at this church. I'm so thankful if you're a teacher. I'm so thankful if you're a yoke fellow. I'm so thankful if you're in the music department. I'm so thankful if you're in the children's department. Can we get a witness on that one? I'm so thankful But the truth is, is if you are neglecting the word of God for the work of God, you have it all backwards. You see, the Bible says it's better to obey than to sacrifice. So better to listen to the word of God. God's word will naturally help you in the areas that are most important to you. We get caught up in the feelings of life instead of the facts of God's word. And you know what? This church must be consumed with the teaching and preaching of the word of God. This must be a church that's known for the teaching and preaching of the word of God over anything else so that we can equip people with the first priority. And here's the last thing, and I'll close. Jesus grew from his devotion. If you look in the last part of this chapter, Jesus grew from his devotion. Look at verse number 50 with me if you have your Bibles. It says, and they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in his wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Jesus' parents did not exactly understand what was going on. But through Mary's indication, she liked what she saw. She liked that she saw her 12-year-old boy wanting to know more about God. It was evident to his parents that he was growing in God's word. In the last verse of this chapter, in the last verse about his childhood, you understand, this is the last verse that we read of the childhood of Jesus Christ. And in the last verse, in the last thoughts of his childhood, we see something very important. These verses show us the example of devoting ourselves to God's word will lead us to favor with God in impacting the world. Let, let me say something. The word favor is misused often by preachers. You know, God, when you live for him and when you devote yourself to his word, God does not promise you that you won't have any more problems. God never promised you that you'll get rich. God never promised you that you would prosper financially. God never promised you that everything's going to be easy if you live right. But God did promise you wherever he plants you that you will be having favor in the work of the Lord. You know, uh, the Bible says when we draw nigh to God that he will draw nigh to us. And James 4, 8 says this, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. You see, our devotion will not leave us the same, but it will give us a heavenly wisdom for a broken world that will leave a lasting impression. Let, Let me read this passage of scripture one more time. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and favor with God. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, when we devote ourselves to the word of God, God promises us that his word does not return return void. How many of you believe that? What if today, instead of focusing more on our issues of life, What if the day, maybe you're here and you say, Pastor Mark, you don't know me. I don't know you. You're going through something right now. God's message was spoken to you today that maybe it's time for you to take your focus off of what you can't control and take your focus on what you can control. And that's devoting your life to the word of God 
so that you can have favor with God and with man. You know how Spring Valley Baptist Church is going to impact its community? Not by the worship, not by ministries, but by this local body devoting themselves to the word of God so that they will have favor with God and man. And when you plant your feet on God's word, well, things can change in your life. You know, the life of Jesus on the way to the cross gives us an example of how to live in this world until we see him one day. Does your devotion need to change? What are you devoted to? Does that need to change? Are you more devoted to something that's not going to last forever? Are you devoted in, 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 to good things, which is keeping you from the great thing of having a relationship with God's word? Maybe you need to change your devotion in this sense. Maybe you say, Pastor Mark, um, I need to take the next step in my faith journey. Maybe you're here today and you don't have a personal walk with Jesus. Maybe you say, Pastor Mark, I want to know God. I'm searching for God, but I don't know him personally. Today, God wants you to start a relationship with him. Maybe you're here today and you, you say, I come on Sundays, but I, I, I need to get further in my journey with a small group. I know sometimes it's awkward to get around a circle or somebody uh, in a smaller setting. But maybe you say, I'm going to step out of my comfort zone. Maybe you're here today and you realize that this church needs more help. And you're going to say, Pastor Mark, I'm going to devote my life to God's word of teaching others. I don't know what it is today. In our short time here, I hope this short message that you won't delay your devotion to Jesus because he's the answer that you keep searching for. Would you bow your heads right there with me as we end the service today? If you bow your head right there for the privacy of others, and I always believe to end a sermon and end a service, God's talked to us. I wonder if it's time for us to talk back to him. Maybe your heart is heavy this morning and your heart is heavy with an issue of life. Maybe your heart is heavy because you're carrying so many burdens. Maybe you're, you're just sitting there and you're indifferent. Maybe it's been a long time since you've rekindled your relationship with Jesus. Maybe what this church is going through has worn you down. Maybe you volunteer so much that you've put the work above the word. My friend, let me say to you in the next few moments, we're going to have an invitation, an open invitation where you can come and pray or have others pray. And I would challenge this church. You individually, you say, I'm going to devote my life to God's word. That's how I'm going to contribute. Father, I pray that you bless this time of invitation. Use it in a mighty way. Would you stand with me there with your heads bowed? And as your heads are bowed, we're going to sing in a song. If God's spoken to your heart, why don't you come pray? Sit down at your seat and pray. Come to the steps and pray. Use this invitation time to think about what is your life devoted to? Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel His mighty power and His grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this.
this place. Amen. Thank you for that word, brother. We all need to be reminded where our roots and our foundation needs to be. And that's God's word. Because without it, we're just a group of people that get together and have a great time. So be reminded of where your feet need to be planted. As we close the service this morning, uh, we challenge you to prepare a backpack uh, for children that have a need. So if you have prepared a backpack, we're going to ask you to bring those. Um, we're staying in an attitude of prayer. Bring those to the altar and place those. And we're going to just pray a prayer of dedication over these because as these go, these are going as an extension of our church family into the community. And you can return to your seats after you uh, bring the backpack. And we're just going to ask God to use a simple gesture to connect our church with the community and let folks say, there's a church that uh, cares about us, that cares about our children. So we're going to do this in both services, and uh, we're going to connect these with children and families that have a need and hopefully connect them with us, and through connecting with us, we can connect them to Almighty God. Let's pray. Father, this morning as we close this time of worship and we reflect on the message of the hour, God, we want to keep our foundation, your word, to challenge us each day to be what you've called us to be. And God, as families have prepared these backpacks with just items that children are going to need to do school. God, we want them to be an extension of your love through us into this community. God, we pray for the children that will receive these. God, we just pray that uh, it's, it's more than just a thing they get. But God, that as they acknowledge uh, its source, God, that curiosity would would pique their hearts, their families' hearts, and God, that we would have opportunity to minister to them in a deeper and greater way that would have an impact throughout eternity. Dismiss us now, God, in your love. Go with us from this place. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.